two-parter here, one being the company overview and two getting into the nitty-gritty of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is the applied support science side, so how our team's actually using the data, right? It's one thing to collect the data, but how can we show value for that? Um, so we'll jump into it here. So the company itself started out in 99, 1999 and really started working in the elite space. Um, has come a long way since then in developing different software and different hardware. And what you're seeing here is now our new open field solution uh, where everything is on the cloud and you're able to pull up that reporting uh, and the devices over there, the, the current generation one. So kind of some interesting tidbits here is, like I said, we started in 1999. Uh, but some of the fascinating points that I like is being a sports scientist that were peer reviewed and valid and reliable metrics is the key thing for me. Um, it's one thing to be able to sell the product, it's another thing to say, hey, this is accurate uh, and this is valuable information. So having that, uh, as well as the community around. So we have 15 workshops we host, uh, all different sports. So whether it be soccer, American football, ice hockey, uh, we host those around the world. And what that's really done is create a community for people to understand what each other are doing in the same realm, and that's not so different. And how do we push that and evolve that through the process? And how do we take something that's worked well in the AFL, who's got a lot more experience than the uh, American uh, market, and apply that over here and make that successful? So those are some, thing, some of the things I like. And here's just a snapshot of, of the teams we work with around the world. Uh, so there's quite a few, and there's quite a few that aren't on here. Uh, some of the, the products that we have are going to be kind of the three tier. So we have our LPS, which is our current generation, or our newest piece of hardware, which is our indoor system. So it's tracking uh, through anchors, an RF signal, so it's able to understand inertial sensors, so how fast, how far the athlete is moving, and have very precise precision on that. Whereas the GNSS and the GPS, you're going to have inherent error in there, um, so it's not going to be as accurate, but it'll still be um, within a, a decent range, and we kind of highlight that on the, on the far right side here. So the GNSS, that S5, is if you run across any program using our technology, that's what you're going to find. Uh, the LPS is starting to become more popular, uh, but the beauty of the, G5, or the S5 is that they can just turn it on and go and start training and start tracking anywhere they are. So as soon as they go off-site and they go to camp, football camp, they don't need to be um, in an arena where it's rigged out and they've spent quite a, an investment in doing that. They just turn it on and go. Uh, and then the, the X4 is uh, another one that impacted. It's only a couple minutes, um, so I'll start that off here. Just being able to see him return to normal 
The other time that sticks out about Kenyon that I was just blown away by was the national championship game against Clemson on his kickoff return. Seeing the data from that, he was running 23 miles an hour on that kickoff return, which just blew me away. And I, I think about I'm driving a car and I'm going 23 miles an hour, and this guy's running down the sideline 23 miles an hour. So that, that'll always be something. That play and, and what he was doing on that play just really stands out to me. Up until recently, Kenyon's performance at, at 23 miles an hour was really our top end speed, but we just had a guy this summer some of our drills this summer that hit around 24, almost 25 miles an hour. So I'm not going to give you his name, but I guarantee you, he's a new guy, I guarantee you, you'll be hearing about him in the fall. There's no doubt. So that kind of gives you a little bit of insight other than how freakishly fast Alabama's athletes are mm -hmm. uh, on how I am Alabama is using it and using it very well. And it's not necessarily about how much information you're collecting. It's how you apply that information and in getting you know, five metrics for them, right? They're looking at five simple metrics to apply that to their organization. And what they do extremely well is they're able to work together with it and they don't silo each other. So the athletes understand the value from it. Strength conditioning coaches understand the value and are big advocates of it. Um, and then the medical and analysts are big, big advocates. And they all talk together, right? They're all in the same room trying to figure out, achieve the same goal, right? How do we win games and get a national championship? Um, and that's something that Unfortunately, I would say it's uncommon in how organizations work together or are trying to work together and they end up siloing themselves and don't communicate across uh, departments. So that's kind of getting after, and I'll, I'll briefly cover this so we can get to some data, of the why, right? Understanding why each department's using it. The value the strength coach gets from it is gonna be entirely different from the positional coach to the head coach, to the sports scientist, to the athlete. So being able to understand that from an organizational standpoint allows you to communicate effectively and how you're going to say, okay, I need to communicate to coach that we're burning this athlete out. How do I communicate that in a report that's actually going to be tangible for him? So really this gets back to the risk readiness return to play model. And again, all these metrics, there's three metrics really that are or four metrics out of there that tell me the same thing, just looking at it in a different way. Player load, I use three times over as a risk model, a readiness model, and a return to play model. It's how I'm using it that's gonna change, right? So being able to identify uh, a player load, so how have I built his capacity and how has he changed that, that's his risk. Readiness is where he's at in the game versus where he's at in practice. Return to play, if he's gotten injured, how do I progress him back to healthy? So here's a example of how teams are using that information. So a big thing that's come out is acute versus chronic with Tim Gavitt, and that's been around for a couple of years now, and teams are really starting to get a hold of it. Um, the, I, the mindset behind that is training, what have you, chronic is what have I done in the last four weeks, versus acute is what have I done in the last week. If I have a huge bump in load today, and I haven't really trained anything in the last four weeks, that's gonna hurt me. And that what that does, it shows a huge spike in that, that black line right there. So I'm able to understand how is an athlete able to tolerate that big jump in load based on what he's done in the last four weeks. And what teams are looking for is those spikes in data and really those back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back spikes and saying, okay, I know I'm gonna put him through a hard practice and I know he's going in fatigue. Is that really where I want him at? Or is it fall camp and I need to push him and I've trained him well for that? So that is a big metric people are starting to look at and literally this visual right here is what they're able to, to pull from it and all they're looking for is a ratio of when he's above or below their set threshold. And every threshold is going to be different for that team or that, uh, that individual athlete. The, another example of risk is looking at a intensity metric over the course of time and a longitudinal. So this is one particular athlete's data over the course of 20 days. And what I'm able to identify here is a downward trend, right? He started off day one over at 11 player load per minute. And basically he's moved around a lot more for the time that he's out there on the field. And over the course of those 20 days, he's starting to decline. So two things are either happening and that's where context comes into play. I, I don't have all the, the answers to this piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, is it because I've just had tacked on a lot of volume and his intensity is going down because he's standing around on the field and it's a lot of dead time? Or is it because he's actually getting fatigued, the duration of the practices are entirely the same, and he's not as explosive 
as he was 20 days ago, and I'm telling him to play a game the next day. Right? So being able to understand that, because if I tell a coach, hey, coach, his ability to be explosive off the line has dropped 50 or 100% from where he was day one. He's not going to be happy. Right? He's going to want to say, I need him ready to go game day. And showing him this visual kind of illustrates that. And I can say, OK, well, maybe if we take him out of a certain drill, we can prevent some of that fatigue. Uh, the readiness example, uh, this is actually a pretty cool example where this is three months worth of data and the action from this client was basically two things. One, reduce soft tissue injury and two, improve physical output at the end of the season. Uh, you'll see this so common whether you have data or not within, um, within college football with really an aim program where everybody looks good the first couple weeks but at the back end in the last you know, three to four weeks, they start tapering off and just start dying. Like they're not performing out there, they look slow, um, and they're fatigued as heck. Because in collegiate ball, you gotta remember, there's midterms and finals coming up um, that's gonna impact their nutrition, that's gonna impact their sleep, that it directly impacts their on-field performance. So if you wanted to achieve two things, one, reduce those soft tissue injuries, and two, improve that physical output at the back end of the season. And the biggest thing that we honed in on is trying to reduce monotony. So having simple things like having high and low days where you think it's common knowledge and, and people say that they do it, but this allows you to objectively find that out, right? So if I zoom in a little closer here, I'm able to see, is that actually happening? Am I actually saying on Monday, we're gonna have a heavy day, and Tuesday, we're gonna have a light day, and Wednesday, we're gonna have a heavy day, Thursday, we're gonna have a light day. Is that what's going on in the, the trend? And if it's not, we can adjust for it then and there. Uh, the first bit you see is camp, and that's what I meant by going back to that acute versus chronic, is what have we done in those last four weeks to be able to prepare that, because that is definitely the most common time for injuries that are, in my opinion, very preventable soft tissue-wise. You're not going to be able to prevent a lot of contact injuries, and especially in the game setting, but if I'm putting a, an athlete through you know, three or four times the workload that he is prepared for or that he's experienced, that's going to cause an issue. So being able to, to monitor and manage that and then know what that whole season outlook uh, looks like. So now they're able to take this and say, what do I need to do over summer and over spring to prepare my athlete for in-game demands and for the whole season, to last the whole season? And that kind of gets at the, the what are we doing in match day, right? It's all about when and how. So when uh, are we playing the games and how intense are they? And if that's the case, if they're that 100%, how does that match up with our progression model? This is an ideal model, right? This is a soccer model, but um, this is basically saying day three should be the heaviest, day two should taper off, and day one should be short, sharp, and very light. And then match days, that's back to 100%. Uh, so this is actually what you get, right? This is the ideal model. This is what you actually get. So this is actually college football data. And what we did here is we basically said that game is that 0%, that 100%, and any plus is extra work you've done over a game, anything below the line is work that is, you know, negative 20% would be 20% less than the game. Uh, what I found here is that the quarterbacks and running backs four and three days out from the game were doing over 100% of the volume that they did in a game day. So it was very interesting, and this, this is starter information, to see that volume-wise, they were kind of getting out of control with game minus four and game minus three to be above that line and then expect the athletes to be ready game day. When I not only hit them hard game minus four, but I also hit them hard game minus three. So how would you communicate that with a coach when a coach, typically their response for like why there's so much is mm -hmm. mental, like they need to get those reps and they need to get those plays down and that's why they're doing so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would kind of go back to saying like, okay, well, we can, we can manage that, like I get, you need the teaching side, so is it a young team who needs to be out there and needs time on feet really high? Um, it's at the end of the day, do we want to be able to perform in a game? And what's that intensity look like? And are, you're telling me we're coming out slow. Well, if you go back to the data in a week, then it's because we're making them do a game two times over in the middle of the week. So maybe we try to remove them, not the whole team, but remove the key players from certain drills and say, okay, I'm not going to go special teams right after a team drill because that means my number one and my number two guys are just running up and down the field and they're just gassed by the, t the end of it. And not only are they giving me low quality reps, 
but I'm putting on a huge amount of volume onto them. Uh, but yeah, you're right on the money. It's a difficult conversation to have, and that goes back to building the relationships with all the people in the organization. So the sports scientist, the strength coach, the head coach, and the positional coaches all have to be bought in. And the work, reason it worked well at Alabama is because Saban's bought in. Like He's the guy that makes the decisions at the end of the day. So if he's bought in, he's going to believe in it, and he's going to trust what you're telling him in terms of the data. Uh, and then another thing that I, I like to do and um, find pretty valuable for clients is establishing game thresholds. So we know what 100% is, but the beauty of having a monitor on each athlete is identifying thresholds per each athlete. I've kind of blocked out the names here, but each line is a different athlete. So I'm able to establish, okay, what do they do on average in a game? What does a low load look like? What's a medium load look like? What's a high load look like? And from that, how can I plan appropriately for that individual athlete? Am I seeing that in the season, my linebacker group is actually doing a lot more than I expected and I'm not training them appropriately? Um, and then you can have those conversations with you know, the positional group or the, the position coach or more importantly, strength and conditioning staff say, hey, in conditioning, we gotta prep them because this is what they're gonna experience in season in a game. Um, and then this is what you can essentially periodize off of. Um, so that's kind of, it on my end, definitely welcome any questions you guys have, uh, but hopefully give you a little bit of insight into the company overview and how some of the teams are using that information. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I know like from a professional level, I don't think any of the major sports have collectively bargained the uh, allowing the wearables, correct? No, in terms of like sharing information back and forth on a league level? Like, no, just the fact that like, they're not allowed to wear them in games? So at the college level, yes. At the professional level, no. Professional with the exemption of MLS. Okay. Um, so MLS and MLB as well, you can wear them. Um, but NBA and NHL uh, are still in progress. Okay, so yeah. your guys' loads, uh, like those algorithms, are they different than uh, perhaps the player tracking data that they're using for, like in their games? Yeah, okay. so that's a proprietary algorithm. So what that's right. doing is it's taking all of the accelerometer data uh -huh. and saying the more you move, the higher that number goes. Okay. So it's highly correlated with running. The reason we developed that is because not every sport's outside. So if you look at total distance, it's highly correlated with player load. Uh -huh. So if you go into a basketball court, you're not going to have any distance data. So what we did is we developed a, a load metric, a volume metric, in order for a coach to say, okay, well, he had 500 load, it's an arbitrary unit, but then how does that relate to the last three weeks of what he's done, and how do I manage that load throughout the course of the season? Okay, so I guess as a follow-up to that, um, like from, I know from the NBA standpoint, uh, there's a little bit of a difficulty using uh, that practice data, because they're recording it in practices, but then in games, they're not able to, uh, you know, have that correlation between it because they're yeah. not able to use so, it yet. Yeah. So what are they what are they doing to try to um, So know, they'll do their out. own like in-house um, statistics package and be able to understand what percent difference it is. So if I track it in a practice setting mm -hmm. and I have an optical solution and I have my wearable solution on, what is the difference in those markers? And then be able to essentially predict the load off of that. So if I know catapult is twenty percent different than a different company's metric, I can account for that. So that's usually done all in-house um, where they'll go and say, okay. Um, stats or, or second spectrum is giving me different information. How do I relate that back to catapult information and account for that? But that's something the client and uh, I would help them work through, and it's not necessarily like a, a published thing that say it's 20% or 30%. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And every athlete's different too, so you got to do it for every athlete, which is pretty time consuming. Any other questions? Right. Yeah. You, show, I'm sorry. Uh, you showed that, that graph of. Um, Min, mean, max loads per yeah that one um, uh, yeah. with the, with a variety of athletes yeah is the, <clears throat> is it is there any meaning in comparing two different athletes maximum load I mean, does that mean anything or is that just um, what, what does that tell us about those two players um, yeah so it it means something the the value behind that load management is very individualized like you go back to every athlete's got a fingerprint every athlete is going to have a different load threshold you know I I could put athlete A, maybe I can push them a lot harder. For his athlete B, they break if I push them, you know, 10 or 15% above of what they're used to. Uh, the different, like if you look at the two, you basically start to see drop-offs. If I know my number one guy's out there and he's the workhorse, and my number two guy's doing half of the load, is it because he's not getting any reps? Is it because he's really efficient? Most likely not if he's the number two. Um, 
you start asking questions. So it leads to more questions than anything. The value I try to get clients is like you should look at it on a longitudinal perspective by, by athlete and understand where their baseline is and how we're adjusting that through the course of the season. Yeah. This is just standard deviation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every team's going to tweak it. Um, but what I just said was low is minus one and high is plus one. And that's, um, I think, like 20 games because it's over the course of two seasons for most people. So it's pretty solid uh, sample size. So most teams starting out are not going to have the ability to say, okay, well, I have one game. Well, that might not be the best way to go off of it, but it's a starting point. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Colin. All right, our final presenter this afternoon is Daniel Whitback, uh, the founder of Way Up Solutions, and he'll be speaking about innovations and in strength training. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, and before I dive into all of that, I want to bring up a principle that, you know, it's got a kind of crazy name, the specific adaptations to impose demands principle. Had I made it, made this principle, I would have named it, you know, do things to your body and your body will react specifically to help those, to achieve and do those things better. Um, and so, if we want to be a more powerful athlete, then we need to lift more powerfully. So power essentially boils down to being force times velocity. And that means that if we want to increase our power over time, if we want to become a more powerful athlete, we're going to be looking to increase force and or increase velocity. So before we dive into that,